Hi everyone, Cody here, and welcome back to Chicken Hole Base. So, as you can see, I've significantly improved the living conditions since the last episode. No more living in a tin can. I managed to get this brought out uh, just before winter started, and it came with a new critter acquisition and termination system, as you can see here. So, this is absolute luxury compared to what I was living in before. Let me uh, show you guys around. So first of all, look at all this room. I can properly stretch my legs. I can do exercises, all sorts of stuff. Ah, it's so great. I've got uh, 110 outlets so I can plug stuff into the wall. The bed is much larger. It's much more comfortable. I can look right out here through the window and I can see the condition of the batteries and the power coming out of the solar panels. <laughs> Over here, I've got a stove and an oven so I can cook my food. Ah, oh, deluxe. I've got running water, which right now is not turned on. It's very cold this time of year, so I try to keep it off so that the pipes don't freeze. Oh, you look out there, you can see the chickens. <laughs> uh, this does have a heater, and it does work, but I'm trying to conserve resources, so... I only turn it on when it's really cold, you know. I do also have a fridge. It's a gas or electric. It does work, but right now it's just being used as a mouse-proof box, essentially, so the mice don't chew into things. If you open this, you can see, here's the bathroom. Flushing toilet, bathtub, shower. Again, this is not turned on at the moment, but uh, all the plumbing and stuff does work, and it's... Uh, very nice. <laughs> uh, when things warm up a little bit, it'll be a lot more easy. And this door here serves double duty. It is also the door to the airlock. You see, come in here, you can turn on the light. You wanna come in? All right. I can close this door, seal it. I can depressurize, but before I do that, of course, I'd wanna put on my suit, which is in this closet here. All right, we'll go out. Let me get on my suit first. So, let me just put this on and we'll go outside, let him go run and also see what's been going on in the base for the last little while. Okay, so here we are outside. Immediately right out the door, you can see an experiment that's going on. I had Robo Cody set this up for me. Uh, sorry about the wind. It's been blowing like this for weeks. It made setting this up really difficult, but here it is. This is to see if we can extract water from the soil. So inside of this is a dehumidifier. It's underneath this tarp, so basically, the tarp will trap heat from the sun, and it also trap the moisture that evaporates out of the soil. So the humidity under the tarp is essentially 100%, and it's also warmer, so this dehumidifier will have a more easy job of condensing the water, and then blowing the dry air back out under the tarp. You see, it's going through a tube, which is going out, exiting over here. You can actually kind of see how it's dry right there where the air is exiting the dehumidifier. So the dry air goes back through, picks up water, and goes back into the dehumidifier for the water to be extracted. The general operating principle of this system is exactly the same as that in a survival solar water distiller that some of you may have made. The main differences are that instead of having to wait for the water to slowly diffuse up, and condense on the plastic sheet. The dehumidifier has a fan to actively move the air and water vapor around. Also, the dehumidifier has refrigerant expansion coils, which get much colder, so the temperature differential between them and the air is much greater than the temperature differential between the air and the plastic here, so the water is able to condense much more rapidly. 
Of course, this does come at the cost of some power, about 500 watts for this setup that I have running. But I'd say that for the amount of clean water it makes, it's worth it for my situation. It's been running for about an hour now. The conditions aren't ideal, but you can see how much we extracted. So, yeah, there you go. See the water dripping into this jar here. Looks like I've got a little over two pints, a little over a liter. That's not bad for an hour. <laughs> I definitely wouldn't do that just in the at atmosphere because the humidity under the tarp is much higher. There's a lot more moisture to condense in there. So it looks like this is a success. And that's very encouraging because this would also work on Mars. You scrape off the top layer of soil to expose the permafrost and the ice will evaporate and the water vapor will get caught by the tarp and it can be condensed. And what I like about this system is it's infinitely scalable. If I had a big enough tarp, I could cover a huge area like this even, acres and acres, and collect, even if I'm just getting a little bit of water from the surface, that over a wide area is a huge amount of water. And uh, speaking of which, you can see all this ice here. This is snow. I had a really big snowstorm a little while ago, and it, uh, I actually got this rover stuck. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh oh, I'm really stuck. <laughs> All right, let me have a look back here. It's holding me. Okay, the chains are still on. There's a big pile of snow up front, that's what's going on. Okay, well. Fortunately, I was able to get rescued. And the only way to move around up here was with snowmobiles. You might be able to see the tracks here. Well, we've definitely been taking advantage of the free water. Uh, it, it should snow a little bit on Mars, especially near the poles, uh, but this right here was a lot of water. And when we were clearing this area here, I had Robo Cody scoop it up and move it into the tanks so it could be stored. This one, I just had just the straight snow, maybe a little bit of dirt. You can see most of the snow is still here. It's been slowly melting. Keep this cover on there so the critters don't get in there. Uh, this one over here uh, that had all that salt in it, if you remember. Well, the salt made the snow melt. So now I've got a big lake of brine, essentially. The melting point is much lower, and that is why it's liquid. <laughs> We can pump that out and use it. I was planning on using it as the ballast inside the gas regulators. Uh, let me show you that over here. So first of all, you can see the water's melting in there as well. But uh, this gas regulator, it's cur currently upside down. But the idea is that it'll be an inner barrel floating on a larger barrel, which is full of water. And then as the gas, like when the sun comes out, the gas expands, it'll go into this and push that barrel up, right? And this maintains the pressure. And the idea was if it was salt water, first of all, it would keep it from freezing so it wouldn't get stuck. And also the density of the salt, salty brine is higher. So it wouldn't need as much of a water column height to get the same amount of pressure and also it would keep it from evaporating as fast. Uh, the biggest problem with this though, for using the brine, would be if there's a leak. If this leaks and comes into the green hab, it'll kill all my plants, because that amount of salt would just be 
could just end it. Uh, so either I need to make sure that it can't leak like ever, or I need to not use brine. And I think that's actually what I'm gonna end up doing. I'll just use fresh water. The brine's not that much more dense anyway. And just the problems with it it really overcomes all of the benefits. I can build a structure around it and add a heater to keep it warm so it doesn't freeze, etc. So we'll have to find something else to do with the brine. Maybe I could run it through pipes and use it as a you know way to defrost things. Move heat around perhaps in a way that I don't have to worry about it freezing. If we look over there. You can see some beehives. Uh, when I mentioned that the bees went to live on a farm last time, a lot of people thought that was code for that they died, but no, they actually did go live on a farm. And I brought them back for the winter, and a little bit later this spring, they're going to be going back to a farm. So here's the little power wagon, which is currently running the dehumidifier. In fact, I can probably just turn this off now. The experiment is a success. But the biggest thing that's changed around the green hab is this ladder you see here. It's bolted on, it's tied down to some bricks at the bottom. Eventually the ground surface will be raised to above this point. And you see here is a grounding spike. It's a metal rod that goes down into the ground. It goes down about five feet. It would have went down farther, but it actually hit rock. And this uh, cable here is attached to that grounding spike. This cable runs up the ladder, as you can see. And eventually I'm gonna have it go up to the top and act as a lightning rod. That way it can disperse any lightning that hits this structure. Uh, the ground is also connected to the wire mesh that's at the base here, and it connects in to the plumbing, so I can ground to that as well. So everything in the system is grounded. Hey boy! Uh, the next task for this is to prep it for planting crops in there again. That needs to happen fairly soon because the weather's getting warmer. You can also see I've been collecting these gallon jugs. Just been saving them. I'm going to use them as weights uh, for the gas regulator. You know, to give it pressure. We'll, we'll work on that more later. But for now. I think he wants us to go in and uh, see what we can do with this water. Well, I'm gonna process it and see if I can drink it. I'm gonna have to run it through a filter or something. Yeah, that should be pretty good. Water extracted from the dirt. <laughs> of course, just shoveling the snow was a lot more efficient, but this could be done any time of the year and presumably is a little bit more clean okay ready to go back in all right oh, bring the water in <laughs> okay let's pressurize Now presumably I could just boil the water to make it safe, kill any bacteria that might be present, or I can pass it through a microfine carbon filter, which is what I'm going to do. So let's just uh, set this up, run my condensed water through this. 
It'll take a little while for it to drip through, but should have clean water. There it is. Dripping through the filter, getting cleaned. All right, let's see if enough has dripped through to be able to come off. There it is. Just get me a little bit of that. <laughs> okay, here we are. Let's give it a taste test. Okay, so it's not the best water in the world. It's essentially distilled water. There's no minerals in it, so the taste isn't that great. In fact, it seems to have picked up the flavor of the tin can itself. But other than that, completely drinkable. Water that came right up off the ground. I like that I can do this. And I like that this could be done on Mars. A system very similar to what I've done there, except it'd probably be collecting it as a solid instead of liquid, but same idea. It could work. So while RoboCody continues to work by moving soil around, putting the main door on the airlock, etc., I thought I would do an experiment here and show yet another source of water that I might be able to access. So this is the dry clay powder that we produced in the last video. Uh, this is the same stuff that we made that little bowl out of. And you can see it's completely dry. It might be able to, I can definitely see dust woofing off above it. So you would think that it would be completely dry, no water. But I think that might not be the case. Let me turn on this little scale here. Zoom in on it so you can actually see. And I'm going to put 100 grams of this clay powder onto the scale. There we go. So now I'm going to take this clay and I'm going to put it into this little steel crucible. As you can see. And transfer this into this little tabletop furnace. Now I'm going to turn it on and heat it up. So this is maybe not the smartest thing to be doing indoors, but I am watching it close and I don't expect anything dangerous to be coming off of this. So clay is a hydrated silicate mineral. In this case, it's volcanic ash, which has reacted with water to form bentonite clay. Now, heating it reverses that reaction. Here are roughly some of the possible chemical equations for the actual reactions that are going on. So if we open this up here, you can see the walls of the chamber is glowing red hot. And we might be able to see some water as steam coming out of the clay. Especially if I give it a little bit of a stir here. Yeah, there we go. And if I take something cold, like this piece of steel, hold it over that, you can see it's fogging up. It's because it's condensing the water vapor that is coming out of the clay. So, if I were doing this on a larger scale, say if I'm firing bricks or something, it might make sense to condense the gases that are coming out of the furnace because a lot of that is going to be water. Okay. It's now cold enough to handle. Yep. I'm going to dump the powder out onto the scale. Let's see what I've got. 82 grams. That means it was roughly 20% water by weight. All right. So there we go. <laughs> Showed a few methods of getting water. Hope you all enjoyed 
I'll see you next time.